My name is Jody Delaney and I teach fourth and fifth grade Montessori over at Broadwater Elementary and I'm talking about first person historical interpretation which is basically anytime you go in and teach a lesson acting as somebody other than yourself and so I might go in and teach a lesson as Martha Washington and act in character and dress up and tell stories. Uh, some of the activities are very short. Today I happen to be a Beatle maniac and we watched the Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan show where they saw the very first Beatles and everybody in the audience is screaming and losing their minds, which is kind of funny to watch nine, 10 and 11 year olds see this for the first time. First off, they're like, it's in black and white and I'm confused. And then there's all these screaming people. And then you see the Beatles and they're like, oh, those old guys. And it was a really fun way to talk about this moment in time and get to see it. And even though obviously we can't go back into the 60s and experience it, they at least get the reference when people are talking about the Beatles, you know, on the Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan show. So it's kind of a fun way to introduce things. I suppose you are all wondering why I have called you here today. We are having an emergency staff meeting. Now, here at the Washington Post, we have had a number of interesting things that have happened over the years. We've covered so many stories, and every now and then we have something really big. Now, at this point, however, we have to make a decision about whether or not we continue to print about the story we've been researching. So, just quick background, you know me, I'm a journalist, I like to go over the facts. So, a couple of years ago, we decided to publish the Pentagon Papers. Do you all remember that? Now, as you'll remember, this was a really big decision, because just prior to us publishing them, there was actually a legal case where the New York Times was not allowed to publish the Pentagon Papers the government's own history of the Vietnam War. Now, we felt in the world of journalism that it didn't pose any national security threat. We weren't endangering anyone's lives. It was just a little bit embarrassing to the White House to publish what had actually happened. Now, at that time, you'll remember, the White House, President Nixon, was extremely unhappy with our decision and threatened us, made all kinds of promises that they would take away some of our licensing, etc. But if you'll remember, I said, let's go, let's publish. Well, we're finding ourselves in a similar hot water situation today. And I'm coming to you because I don't just want to make this decision all by myself. So first off, so it gives them this great connection to all these different characters and people from different time periods and cultures, and they feel like they've made this connection with them. And so at the end of the day, when we're doing history lessons, we're really trying to build a sense of historic empathy and to have this sense of a connection to the past. Because otherwise, it's just dates and names to memorize, and it's boring, and who wants to learn about that? But the more we can make that connection to the past, and the more that it's told through biography and through stories, the more it actually feels like it's relevant and that it's worth learning. And a lot of those stories and struggles that people have been dealing with for hundreds of years, they're the same struggles that we're dealing with now. And it's kind of a nice way of seeing like, oh, hey, humanity, we've survived all this other stuff. We'll probably be fine. It's going to be OK. So it's, it's a great way for them to build that historical empathy over time. Um, I was always fascinated with history. Uh, my dad would tell wonderful historical stories. We'd be out checking cows and pretending to be like Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea and all sorts of different characters from the past. And we would travel around and go to Bannock and look at these different places. And we had actually gone to a few places that had costumed interpreters, first person historical interpretation. I was always a very theatrical child and just absolutely loved that idea. Like, oh, I want to work here. How can I live here? <laughs> and so um, I think it, it all kind of fell together in a very natural progression where it takes my interest areas in different arts integration and history and the artistry of fabric arts and clothing and costuming 
and it, it was just this wonderful perfect storm of oh my gosh you know what you can do with this ah this is amazing um, I've also taken it to a few conferences and tried to kind of spread the word um, it's a bit of a tough sell uh, just because it's an unusual uh, pedagogical technique is the fun fancy word for it but it's an unusual pedagogy to use in teaching a lesson but I think it's an extremely natural way for people to learn that we learn through telling stories oh my gosh let me tell you what happened the other day and so when you have maybe a more complicated concept it's a math concept or something like that you can get up and you can just teach it straight okay the kids who like math might pay attention but if you come in dressed as like Rene Descartes and I mean, you're <laughs> you're like, what is going on? That, that's not normal. Then you can teach the same lesson and just say, you know, I was thinking the other day as I was in bed, I was watching a fly across the ceiling. And the story that he tells about how he discovered the Cartesian plane, you can just tell it as Descartes telling the story and teaching the whole, here's how the Cartesian plane with the coordinate system works. Like, oh, that's so much more interesting. Who wouldn't want to learn that way? Yeah. And so the mathematical kids are still going to listen and be happy. This is cool. But all the other interest areas are more likely to be intrigued by that than just a straight, oh, here's our math lesson for today. So it causes you to have to be a more engaging speaker. And the interest then, it feeds back and forth between the kids and yourself, which is just so much more fun. <laughs> I originally started by looking in my classroom and I noticed there was this weird strip of wall that was 185 inches long and five inches tall. And I went, what can I do with that weird strip of wall? I went, oh, well, 185, there's 180 school years, school days in the year. Okay, so I gotta do something with like a daily piece of something. And so I got to thinking about, oh, timelines. I could do a timeline, okay. Well, in 180 inches, if I did two years per inch, I could cover over 300 years. And each year we add on to our own timeline. So the longer I teach, the longer the timeline gets. And then I went, okay, I teach fourth and fifth. So one side of the timeline is Montana history and the other side of the timeline is US history because they are different. They obviously connect in certain places, but US and Montana history are extremely different for a long time, especially in the beginning. There is a lady named Stacy Roth, and she basically both wrote the book on first-person historical interpretation. So she's one of the people who worked at places like Colonial Williamsburg, where they started having costumes interpreters. So it's kind of an older term, comes out of another guy named Samuel Tilden, who wanted people who go to national parks to have some kind of understanding of what they were looking at and why is this so amazing. So he decided we needed interpreters to explain the significance of things. And eventually that idea of interpreters kind of permutated and morphed and changed and Stacy Roth started talking about being in character as someone from the past. And that is a really cool tool for a classroom situation because I can't go to Colonial Williamsburg with my class. That would be such an expensive field trip. But I can come in as somebody from Colonial Williamsburg and I can still tell the same stories and we can still get into the same information and I don't have to try to schedule a guest teacher or find money to pay for them. I can just do it, it works in our schedule, and then we move on with our day. Um, the big piece of this that makes it so fun is that it has this kind of magic teacher's aura to it where you get to come in and there's an aspect of edutainment but there's also content and it's important information that you're sharing but it's in such a fun and unusual way that it automatically hooks your students attention and the engagement when I'm doing one of these lessons is so much more heightened because it's kind of like what's gonna happen next like whoa I gotta watch this so some of the lessons are just very short. A lady might come in, tell a story or two from her life, and some of them are much more involved. So for example, I have one where uh, Typhoid Mary comes in, 
by the way, she does take exception to be calling typhoid Mary. Her name is Mary Mallon, and she comes in, tells her story, uh, and it's taken from an actual letter that she wrote when she was in forced quarantine saying, you should let me go. The students are then members of the Board of Health, and they have to decide what should we do with this lady. So they have to learn a little bit about typhoid and how it spread, and we learn a little bit about this is the very beginning of germ theory, and people are starting to understand public health, and they have to decide, do we let her out or do we make her stay? And if you let her out, what are you going to do with her? Are there requirements? And if you make her stay, what are you going to do with this lady? And it's really fun because they get to do the decision making, they get to interact with Mary in character, and then they have to deliver their reasons and they actually have to have backed up, here's why and here's what we're going to do. Um, and in reality, she was released and they did have requirements and she didn't follow any of them. And so they went, found her and put her back in the incarceration there and she ends up living out the rest of her life in forced quarantine. So both groups end up being right, that each one kind of got to see what happens when their way is what happens. Um, and it's a really wonderful lesson on why you need to wash your hands because she didn't wash her hands and she was a cook and that's how everyone got sick. So it's a really memorable way to remind elementary kids like we're not kidding, you need to wash your hands, please and thank you. And so they're, they're really fun because I've tried to bring in people from many different walks of life and different time periods so that they get a little better window into the past. Um, and it, it's one of those things that has kind of evolved over time. It started more with just the historical fashion, but then some of the outfits looked like particular people, and people were like, oh my gosh, you, you look like Janis Joplin today. And I was like, oh, that's funny, I do look like Janis Joplin today, awesome. I'm gonna go sing me and Bobby McGee and it'll be funny. Well, eventually, uh, I was part of the Creative Pulse Graduate Studies Program at the University of Montana. They're amazing. So I got my master's in arts integration for education. And while I was there, I took what I was doing, which was fun. There was edutainment. It was great. It was a good engagement tool. And we learned more about um, material culture of the past. But then it kind of amped it up to the ninth degree where that's when I started adding the acting in character part. And part of what Stacy Roth talks about is you have a message to deliver and the characters are the envelope that you deliver it in. Well, I had to go back and look at my list of people and some of them, they just weren't very good envelopes. Like, what does Janis Joplin have to share with the youth of America today? Other than you should be careful, don't do drugs, like make good life choices. But she just didn't really have a great message to share. So that was on my timeline at about 1970. And I have this kind of general hippie-ish outfit. So I started trolling the internet and went, all right, 1970. Oh, that's the height of the Vietnam protest era and you've got Ohio State. So then I started looking through um, first-hand oral history accounts of people who had been in um, the, the events that had occurred there with um, protesters and National Guard being called out and firing on students. I had to troll through for one that was age appropriate for young people, so I didn't need to talk about too much gore and yuckiness. Um, but now that same outfit, I can come in and there's this wonderful ladies history that I found on their website, a lady named Catherine Delatre, and she tells her whole story about what was going on at the time and what she cared about, and her boyfriend, who is now her husband, and how he was getting pulled up, his draft number was coming up, and why they were so invested in this. So that ended up being a far more interesting story than Janis Joplin, me singing Bobby McGee, like being silly. So changing these over, I started looking for more scientists, more inventors, more this, that, and the other. Um, and another one that I ended up finding was this amazing woman named Joan Trumpauer Mulholland. And she was one of the people who went to the Woolworths sit-in during the civil rights movement. 
Um, and I do happen to limit myself to the original idea was if I got into a time machine and I popped out somewhere between 1650 and the modern period in American history, what would I look like? So by limiting that, it also meant that I was limiting myself to white females. But I didn't want to just only tell the stories of white females. So I was trying to go through history and find white females who had been privileged observers of specific historical events. And this Joan Trumpauer ends up being a really amazing firebrand of a young Southern lady who realizes that she needs to go do something about this injustice in the world. She heads on down and is arrested and thrown in jail and all of these amazing, wonderful things. So she just has such a powerful story to bring in and share with kids. And I start by showing them her, uh, her mug shot. And they're used to, these are always really amazing women, and they're like, this one got arrested? Like, <laughs> but, but mm, how does that work? And I say, well, what if you're fighting against a lie you don't agree with? And we have a good discussion on whether or not that is okay. So you'll be happy to know the youth of today are very concerned about following rules. <laughs> they are not okay with breaking the laws. But then she tells her story, and it's a really fun way to look at, there's a little bit of gray area in every historic event of, is this good or is this bad? And so they get to start kind of making some judgment value choices on that. And that's one of the things that research shows makes this approach so valuable, is that they have to engage in historical thinking in ways that it really makes them kind of question, like what's right, what's true, what's good, what's bad, and having to make those kind of judgments, learning that it all has to do with your point of view. So her point of view, totally justified, but from somebody else's point of view, no, maybe not. So those are kind of the, the background, at least, of why we use it and how it's, uh, it's really just a wonderful way to enliven the world, to bring in guest speakers that you wouldn't otherwise ever be able to get. Um, some of them are still alive, like Joan, but most of the people in my timeline, they lived so long ago that I can't exactly get Martha Custis Washington to come chat with us. You know, she's just all booked up these days. <laughs> So actually I can show you this dress. So this is one that I used for Sarah Josepha Hale and I kind of went through and figured out what are the basics of an 1830 dress and how do I build that. The final version looks nothing like any of the sketches that I made. Um, but then you go through and you start figuring out what are the pieces, what are the parts, how do I construct it, how do I build that. Um, and so there's some really amazing historians who have worked on what people wear and how they put it together. Uh, here's a great Montanan. Um, I used this for a lady named Hazel Hunkins who was a suffragette from Billings, Montana. Um, and then this is one that I put together for Margaret Daly. So this is Margaret Daly's soiree dress. Um, and she would be the wife of Copper King Marcus Daly. So all the Copper Kings were men, and since I only dress as women, that kind of limits who I can talk about. But by coming in as Mrs. Daly, she's the wife of Marcus, and her little sister marries one of the Clarks. And so she is a privileged observer who can come through and start telling stories about uh, the people and the time period. Um, she's really fun because I actually have gotten to uh, interpret her at the Daily Mansion. And so that was really awesome. Uh, Darlene Gold, wonderful uh, coordinator there for all of their volunteers. And I got to go down and hang out with them at the museum, uh, the, the house there. And when we did the, um, the history conference this past year, it was held down in Hamilton. And so I, got to really nerd out and go around and talk to people as Mrs. Daly and welcome to my home, let me show you around. Uh, so I was really, really thankful that I got to do that.
And everything is neurotically organized by person and time period. So this is where I start and then things kind of cycle through. So this, the beginning and the end are actually right next to each other. So there's the 1650s right next to the 2000s. <laughs> and then I have my big list. So that's the complete timeline so that I can remember, where am I tomorrow? Like, well, here we have one of the newer ones that I made, Emma Hart Willard. She is a, a, a fantastically fascinating lady. She worked for years to get Thanksgiving recognized as a holiday, and she was the uh, editor of a very popular women's magazine, Ladies uh, Goaties Home Journal. And uh, she also is connected to the Mary Had a Little Lamb poem. She liked writing, and so she wrote poetry and essays. And so now I have a nice 1830s style dress that I can come in and talk about everything from Thanksgiving to Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> and I, one of the things that I tell people is that this is a great way to fight teacher burnout when you feel like, oh man, I feel like I'm just doing the same things over and over again, and how do you try to get your kids motivated? How do you, like, oh, it feels like I'm always trying to lift everything up. Well, here, it feels more like you can do an interdisciplinary lesson where there's historical context, and then there's content from whatever area I'm trying to teach, whether it's science or math or whatever, and I can do both at the same time. And so it's just such a wonderful whole brain approach to learning. And the fact that you make it interdisciplinary, where you're talking about multiple things at the same time, it's making connections in the brain so that students can actually remember what you're talking about. So the more we do this subject and this subject and this subject, and they're all separated, the less students remember them because there's no connections. Why bother? So this adds a level of relevance and rigor to what you're trying to teach, and it's just fun. Like, it's just fun. <laughs>